Hello and welcome to everyone joining us for the seventh in our webinar series with Limit State Products with a focus on their features and their particular applications. For those of you who haven't attended one of our webinars before, my name's Tom Pritchard and I'll be introducing our speaker and also wrapping up at the end of the session. Today's webinar is titled Eurocode 7 Analysis Using Limit State Geo and it's designed to provide you with an overview of how you can apply Limit State Geo, which is our geotechnical stability analysis software, in the analysis of a range of problems in compliance with the Eurocode 7 codes of practice. Amongst the topics for today are such things as an overview of Eurocode 7, uh, the principles of computational ultimate limit state analysis, uh, limit state analysis with limit state geo, and material factoring and action resistance factoring using limit state geo. You'll also see how limit state geo can be used to repair foundation, retaining wall and slope stability designs in accordance with Eurocode 7. As ever, the webinar is due to last around one hour and will include some time at the end for questions. These can be posted by the question functionality that's present in the webinar interface that you should all have on your screens. Uh, we do try to answer as many of your questions as we can and in the time available, but it's not always possible, so we're sorry if we don't get around to yours. Um, if you do have some very technical questions that may take some time to answer, you're more than welcome to contact us outside of the webinar via info at limitstate.com and we'll be happy to answer these in detail for you. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome our speaker today, who is Dr. Colin Smith, and he's the Limit State Geo Product Manager, and I'll now pass you over to him. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good morning to those of you in the European time zone. Good afternoon or evening to those of you joining us from elsewhere in the world. Uh, as mentioned today, uh, my aim is to show you how Limit State Geo can be used to solve problems to Eurocode 7, and to this end, I'll be using a mixture of slides and the software to illustrate the key points. And we'll be looking at a, a mix of basic principles and example problems. Um, so, um, so uh, as Tom has mentioned, uh, in terms of the contents, we'll look at a brief recap of the principles of Eurocode 7, um, then look at the ultimate limit state analysis approach, and uh, then pick up on specific details of how factoring approaches can be carried out in the mid-state geo. Um, as it's a problem-specific webinar, I'll focus on how the software can be used to solve problems to Eurocode 7, therefore may skip over some details of how to use the software, but hopefully the process should be clear. Um, for those of you who are new to this webinar series, um, it's useful just to give you a brief context of the software and the company Limit State. The University of Sheffield has been conducting research into limit state analysis and design and the use of optimization in civil engineering for almost two uh, decades now. Uh, the company was uh, spun out from the University of Sheffield in 2006 with the aim of making this research available to industry. Of course, you want not only powerful tools, but also ease of use and support, which is what Limit State provides. Um, the company also has sophisticated testing systems in place that mean every time the software is changed, over 800 tests are automatically run to ensure the software does what it is supposed to do. The company has two products at present. Sorry, uh, Limit State Ring and um, Limit State Geo, which is what we're talking about today and several more in the pipeline. Just to set the software in the context of currently available software, on the one hand we have software based on conventional approaches such as the method of slices, uh, which do a pretty good job specifically for SOAP problems, and then for more complex analyses, finite element software is available which can model any problem geometry and complex soil behavior, but typically requires a lot more expertise to use. Perhaps filling the gap in between these two is computational limit analysis, providing an ultimate limit state analysis capability with the geometry flexibility of finite elements and the ease of use and simplicity of traditional methods. The only parameters required are C phi and gamma, essentially unit weight, and um, this is essentially what the software limit state geo provides. Uh, this next slide just gives you an illustration of the range of the capability of the software. Um, it's able to determine the collapse state for any problem geometry and able to model slopes, retaining walls, and structural elements and soil reinforcement as shown by some of these examples. Um, but our aim today is to focus very much on Eurocode 7. 
So I'm first going to recap on some of the key relevant principles relevant to today's webinar. Um, Eurocode 7 um, moves away from traditional approaches, which is uh, approaches which looked at working stresses and overall factors of safety, and uh, moves to a limit state design approach using partial factors, and it has a broadly unified approach in that it uses the same factors for any particular geotechnical problem, whether it be a slope, a retaining wall, or a foundation. It also introduces a range of separate checks. It requires explicit checks of the ultimate limit state and the serviceability limit state. And uh, in the ultimate limit state, it requires a check of a number of different possibilities. The most common ones are failure of the structure and failure of the ground. And um, these are ultimate limit state checks, which is exactly what uh, limit state geo does. So we're going to focus on these, these cases today. Now, if you've used Eurocode 7, you'll be aware that uh, loads or actions are factored according to their type and favorability. So whether they're permanent loads, variable loads, or accidental, and also there are different factors applied if the loads are favorable or unfavorable, i.e. they assist or resist collapse. Um, and this might not be clear at the outset when you're actually analyzing a problem. And the purpose of these factors is to convert what are called the characteristic actions. So these are conservative estimates of the actions um, applied to your problem. And they convert them to what are called design actions, which are used for the design checks to see if the design complies with the Eurocode. Now, uh, currently, there are three design approaches in the Eurocode. Um, and their use in different countries in, in, in Europe. Uh, so we have design approach one, design approach two, and design approach three. And design approach one is split into two combinations. And each of these design approaches has its own set of factors. Um, the typical factors are given in this table. Um, so we, what we'll see um, is that design approach one, combination one, uh, essentially applies factors onto the actions or the loads, but does not factor material properties further down. And um, combination two uh, applies pretty much unit factors to the actions or loads, but does factor material properties. And design approach two and three have various other combinations there. We're going to focus primarily on design approach one today, but the principles that we're going to look at will be applicable to all approaches. Now, the key equation in Eurocode 7 is to uh, identify an action and a resistance in the problem and basically show that the factored actions are less than or equal to the factored resistances. If that is shown, then the design said to comply with the code. If there are two design combinations to look at, then both of those must be satisfied uh, together. Now, for many problem types, this is straightforward. For some others, uh, particularly um, where there are things like earth pressures involved, it can lead to some complications for some design approaches, and we'll, we'll pick up on that a little bit later. OK, so um, we'll... Uh, look at the software now and um, just go a little demonstration to try and illustrate some of these points. Um, so this is the uh, Limit State Geo software and what I'm going to do is just set up quickly uh, a simple footing problem. The software has the facility to very quickly generate common problem geometries using uh, Quick Build Wizard. Uh, but you can set up your own geometry and, and just draw that from scratch. So I'm just going to run this simple footing wizard. It has a number of settings. I'm just going to accept the defaults uh, for our convenience. And we have this problem. But essentially, it's a footing on the surface of the ground. This gray block, it's a, a load applied to it and the soil below. If we look at the load here, so I'm going to click on this load. And another thing I uh, click on or select in the screen, its properties appear on the right here in the property editor. Um, this uh, shows us what loads we have. And you'll see that we can set permanent, variable, or accidental loads acting on this. So we can, we can have one or more of these applied. At the moment, um, we've applied a permanent load. 
it's actually set to one in this case. Um, uh, we can apply shear components. Um, so we have a facility to set all three Eurocode types, and we can also change the setting of the loading type from unfavorable to favorable if we wish, so we can define that as well. You'll note we've also got a setting called neutral in the software. This is not a Eurocode designation, but it's there primarily in the software as a default setting um, so that it's clear that the user must alter it for a Eurocode or a partial factor type analysis. Um, otherwise, the software wouldn't know by default whether these loads were favorable or unfavorable. Uh, if you set it to neutral, that means essentially the quantity is always factored by one, regardless of the um, design approach used. Now, self-weight can also be regarded as an action. So if I click on this foundation block, um, we can see that for self-weight loading, that is also designated as unfavorable in this case. Uh, again, we can set it to favorable or neutral. And essentially that is applied to the self-weight of the block. And in this case, uh, self-weight of, of materials are always regarded as permanent loads in the software. Now, um, if the, given all these designations, how do we actually control what factors are applied? Well, we, we use a scenario manager up here under the analysis menu bar, and that allows us to set partial factors for unfavorable loads for favorable loads on material properties, and it also allows us to switch between long and short term analysis. So it gives us the flexibility to um, very quickly control that, and we can run multiple scenarios so it's possible to um, actually set up new uh, new scenarios. So for example, if I, if I click new here, um, no, sorry, if I uh, click here, I can generate, I can um, set up uh, the Eurocode 7 design approach one combination one factors. So these are now changed. So before you run the problem, all permanent unfavorable loads will have their values multiplied by 1.35 and so on. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, then scenario two, if I want to run another one, I could also run design approach one combination two. So now I've got two scenarios in the problem. And when I run the software, it will actually solve the problem first using design approach one combination one factors and second using design approach one combination two factors. So those I'll leave set up. Um, now, when we run a problem, Diagnostics will automatically be run. In this case, uh, it tries to just give you some information about the problem, which can be helpful just to make sure you have set it up correctly. Um, so for example, here it's telling us what we've set on different boundaries, neutral um, and unfavorable loading in different cases. So uh, we can pick up very rapidly what we've actually defined in terms of um, favorable, unfavorable, and so on. Uh, we also get a little warning saying that we've we've actually set the scenario manager to apply non-unit load factors. Um, so that's just a reminder us to check that's what we wanted to do. We we're aware of that. Um, we can also uh, very quickly establish what um, is being applied to different boundaries. So for example, here, it may be that we have surcharges either side of the wall of the uh, foundation. They might be variable surcharges. I'll put in a value of, say, 5 here and unselect that and put one on the other side. And um, I can use a, uh, let me have a look, a few very useful um, to also ascertain quickly what, what we've set on particular boundaries. I can use these explorers. We have a thing called a boundary explorer that will pop up down here on the bottom screen. And that goes through all the boundaries. Um, and if I click on them, it'll, it'll highlight those, tell me what they are, and it'll tell me what support types I have, but particularly what loading type I have on these boundaries. And I can see that I've got two 
boundaries B5 and B6, which I've just set, have got favorable variable loads on them. And um, boundary B1 has a permanent load, and it's or it has been set to neutral in this particular case. So uh, different ways of accessing the, the information, um, but if you want to just in terms of just checking that everything has been set as, as you uh, intended, then these can be very useful. Okay, so that's just a, a quick um, introduction to how the uh, how we set the various parameters for a Eurocode analysis. Um, before we actually run actually run and solve some examples, I'll I'll revert back to the presentation and. We'll just recap on what we actually mean by the ultimate limit state and ultimate limit state analysis. And uh, so in general, anything we design, we expect to be inherently stable and shouldn't be anywhere near its ultimate limit state. Um, but if we're taking an ultimate limit state analysis, somehow we have to drive the system to collapse in order that it, it, it is actually at its ultimate limit state. And uh, we can do this implicitly or explicitly. In many conventional analyses that you look in textbooks, the process is typically implicit. It's not clearly stated that this is what is happening. Um, but when we use a numerical analysis, we have to be quite clear about this. So it's very important when, when setting up these analysis to be clear how we're driving the system to ULS and how that relates to our Eurocode um, approach. So uh, in this software, we have two uh, ways of doing that. Um, one is to say, well, we can drive a system to failure by increasing a load or an unfavorable load somewhere. And so the question here, for example, is on this wall, how, by what factor A do we have to multiply the surface surcharge by to cause collapse? Um, and that is returned by the software as an adequacy factor on load. Alternatively, we can ask the question, how much smaller does the strength of soil need to be to cause collapse, or by what factor do we need to reduce that by? And that gives us the adequacy factor on strength. Uh, and again, that's returned by the software. So we've got two possible ways of driving the system to collapse, increasing the load or reducing the strength of the material until we get to collapse. Now. In either mode, if we get an adequacy factor return that is greater than 1, then we find the system is stable. If the adequacy factor is less than 1, then the system is unstable. Uh, and if we're going to apply adequacy factor to a load, um, and we'll, we'll see in a moment how we do that, then it should be applied to any other, any unfavorable load in the system. Um, and this number that we get back will correspond in general to a global factor of safety on the parameter we've set it on, or on an over-design factor if we've already applied partial factors. So we'll now uh, flip back to the software and actually just see how this, this is done in practice. Uh, so I'll just rerun that simple footing. Uh, it's its original form. And, oh, sorry, uh, run the wrong one, run the gravity wall wizard. So this is building this gravity wall problem. Um, if I run the diagnostics, that will just tell me very briefly what, what's happened in the problem. So we've got uh, what we call the adequacy factor applied to the boundary load. So this is what the software is being told to increase until we get collapse. And we can apply that to one or more uh, loads. Um, in this case, we're just applying it to the surface boundary load. Uh, and if I click on this hyperlink, it highlights the boundary that's being um, to which it's applied. And we specified that as an unfavorable. And uh, everything else, all the all the solid bodies or bodies of soil, have just been set to neutral in terms of um, whether it's favorable, unfavorable, or neutral. So if I solve this problem. What I'm asking the software is, what do we have to multiply that surface surcharge by to get collapse? And we get an answer down here in the in this window here of just over 20. 
So that means we have to multiply that load by about 20 to get collapse. And the load was originally set, if I just click on it here, uh, it's a variable load. It was set, uh, it's actually been set to five vertically. These are, because it's not normal, to, uh, perpendicular to the surface, we've got a slight shear and normal component, but they add up to five. So essentially we have to multiply that load by 20. I mean, that load has to be 100 kPa to cause collapse, and that we can call the factor of safety on the surface load. Um, however, uh, driving this thing to failure, it's not only the surface load, but the weight of the soil behind. So we can also add, set the adequacy of that to true. So what we're now asking the software to do is to say, what do we have to multiply the surface surcharge by and the unit weight of the soil here together? What number do we have to multiply both of those by to cause collapse? So if we solve that, we will get a somewhat different failure mode because we're asking a slightly different question of the software. And I'm getting an answer of around about three. Um, and this is clearly a lot less than 20, and that's because clearly the uh, weight of the backfill behind the wall is dominating in terms of trying to push that wall over. It's much more significant than the surface surcharge, so we don't have to multiply it by such a large um, number. So this number three is a factor of safety on the loads behind the wall, that's the surface surcharge and the backfill. And finally, we could ask the software, what is our factor of strength? So uh, I can switch the mode here from factor strength to factor load. So here, um, factor strength just factors of strength. It ignores any of our settings of adequacy and loads here. And um, it's going to come up with a number fairly close to three as well. This won't be the, it's not exactly the same as the previous solution. And again, we get a different mechanism of failure. Um, but what it's saying is we have to divide the soil strength everywhere by three in order to uh, get this system to collapse. Now, all um, these Adequacy factors are different, but the key thing is that they're all greater than one, which means the system is stable. Something has to be changed um, in order to cause collapse. And the only time we're guaranteed to get the same numbers on the adequacy is when we have an adequacy factor of one. That essentially means that we don't need to change the system at all um, in order for it to collapse, i.e. The, the system we're modeling is on the point of collapse. And that's a kind of key point when it comes to interpreting um, the Euro code. So we'll uh, we'll just flip back to the slides and see how that ties in. So uh, we said before that um, the Euro code requires us to show that factored actions are less than factored resistances for a design to comply. Um, if we have a design approach where we're just a factoring values before we do our analysis, um, such as factoring the strength or factoring a load on a foundation, then this is equivalent to showing that in an ultimate limit state analysis, the adequacy factor is bigger than one. And this approach has the um, additional advantage of covering all possible failure modes which are consistent with the direction of the loads in which adequacy is applied. So it gives us uh, a lot more flexibility, um, and we just have to remember this uh, relationship that we're really hunting for the adequacy factor bigger than one once we've uh, applied the factor. Um, and what we'll do now is we'll have a look at some uh, some more examples. So just to illustrate this, so I'm going to revert back to the foundation problem. And we're going to look at this in the context of design approach one, combination one. So I'm going to set in the scenario manager, design approach one, combination one. So it's going to apply the appropriate factors. And I'm going to put a load on here. Now, by default, this is just a unit load. I'm going to set this to a, uh, a permanent load of 100. Uh, I'm going to have this adequacy set to it. So we're asking the software, how much bigger does that have to be to cause collapse? 
and it's set to unfavorable, which is what I want. Um, I'm also going to uh, do the same with a foundation, so the weight of the foundation block itself, it's a simple foundation in this case, but its weight is also relevant. So what I'm going to do is uh, set, that's already set to unfavorable, and if I look at its material property, by default the wizard sets it to zero weight, I'm going to set it to the weight of, of concrete, um, and I'm also going to set the adequacy to true. So we're going to ask the software the question, how much bigger does that surface load have to be and the weight of the foundation to cause collapse? And generally, it's it's a good idea to apply the adequacy factor to, to all your unfavorable loads. Um, the soil here, it's self-weight strictly for an undrained problem. It, its weight has no effect whatsoever on the on the collapse load if for a surface foundation. So it's strictly neutral in this case, but it might be favorable in other cases. Um, but in either either way, it's going to be factored by one in the euro code. Okay, so we've we set the problem up. We've set uh, design approach one, combination one in the scenario manager, and so uh, we can solve. We get diagnostics pop up again, uh, worth just checking um, that we have set the problem up as we we wished. So we can go through those and, and check those. I won't do this at the moment, um, and we'll solve the problem. So it's identifying the collapse mechanism, and it's giving me an adequacy factor of 1.75. So this means that as well as the weight, the loading on the foundation and the foundation weight itself having been multiplied by uh, a design approach one combination one factor of 1.35 automatically, it needs an additional factor of 1.75 to uh, cause collapse. Um, so this is in a sense, an additional factor of safety on the loads, and clearly um, the actions must be less than the resistances in this problem. The resistance is that provided by the soil as it forms this failure mechanism, the actions are the applied loads, and this is telling us we have to increase the actions even further to get collapse, so clearly actions must be less than resistances. So we can say in this case that the design complies with design approach one combination one. And in general, if as long as we get an adequacy factor bigger than one, then the design will comply for any failure mode involving downward movement of the foundation, since that's the direction in which the uh, the adequacy factor has been applied and the act, these actions all act downwards. Now, uh, we'll now look at a problem uh, in design approach one combination two. So we look at a gravity wall. I'll just accept the defaults for the problem. Again, if we examine the problem, uh, as before, we look at the loads here. This is set as unfavorable, and it's set as a variable load of five. Um, setting here has been set to neutral. Uh, we would probably regard that as unfavorable. And we might regard the soil in front of the wall as, as favorable. Now, these settings only affect a design approach which factors uh, actions. Um, we're going to look at design approach one combination two, and it makes no distinction between permanent favorable and permanent unfavorable loads. They both get factored by one. So it, it, having just set those, it doesn't really matter in this particular context. Um, for design approach one combination two, well, the only thing we really need to be clear about is variable favorable and variable unfavorable loads. Um, so we'll uh, just run this with the adequacy factor applied to this variable load. So that's been set to true there. So we're asking the software how much bigger does that have to be to cause collapse. As we said earlier, any unfavorable load will do or combination of unfavorable loads. We're going to set in our scenario manager the um, design approach one combination two so these is automatically going to pre-factor the soil strengths by these numbers down here uh, and also the variable um, unfavorable load by that number and then it will solve so if I click solve get those diagnostics again and it's telling me that I have roughly uh, 
got to multiply in order to get collapse even after applying the Eurocode partial factors and reducing the strength of the soil and increasing the variable unfavorable load by 1.3 I have to in addition to that still increase that surface surcharge by a factor of nine and a half to get collapse so this is well above one as long as it's bigger than one then again um, the design complies with the code I haven't specifically specified any action and resistance pair to compare here um, but it can be shown that any action and resistance pair in the problem um, and this could be say the active pressure on the wall versus the passive pressure and the shear on the base uh, any of those will satisfy the actions less than resistance criterion if the adequacy factor is bigger than one and actually it's 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 kind of when you're using numerical analysis it's a, it's a little bit of a retrograde step to consider specific action resistance pairs or specific failure modes um, it fails to use utilize the full power of the analysis this analysis essentially um, is showing that this design complies with design approach one combination two for any failure mode of this wall whether it be sliding overturning or bearing failure there's no need to separately check for those as long as the adequacy factor is bigger than one um, this complies and there's only just one caveat on that the failure mode must be consistent with the direction of the load onto which adequacy is applied ie we've applied adequacy to the surface surcharge the failure mechanism must involve that surcharge moving downwards uh, in other words that surcharge is doing positive work um, uh, and that's the only criterion so if if the surcharge is moving upwards then that's violated but clearly in all those all those problems um, the surcharge would be moving down in general for those problem types now um, we've solved this problem in the software using factor on load but again the basic principle is if the adequacy factor is bigger than one we're okay we could also have modeled solved it using the factor strength mode and in this particular case again as long as the adequacy factor is bigger than one that means we've got to make the system the soil weaker to get collapse then we can say that the actions less than resistance criterion is satisfied now this might be a slightly more natural uh, way of factoring with design approach one combination two because this is basically a material factoring approach so it, it reduces the strength of the soil um, and this adequacy factor is then an additional margin of safety over and above the Eurocode factors on those strength, fact, those strength factors so again we've got an additional margin for this particular case of two roughly on the strength of the soil over and above the Eurocode factors themselves so that's um, two uh, examples uh, just showing how we solve these problems and they're basically approaches where pre-factoring is uh, is what we're doing we're factoring loads or strengths before we actually do our numerical analysis and that works for a, a, a wide range of problems but not all problems and where it doesn't work necessarily we need to think a little bit more carefully about how we analyze the problem is situations where actions and or resistances are factored and one or more of these actions or resistances are not known in advance of the analysis so for example we could be talking about an earth pressure and strictly we need to know what the uh, we need to do an analysis we need to do a, a collapse analysis in order to determine those earth pressures and then at that point we might factor those um, so we need to take a slightly different viewpoint on these particular problems and um, it's worth just taking a step back to consider the general question of when and where to factor in these problems so just quickly recap on that um, if you look at any particular problem there are actually different stages of a design calculation at which actions or action effects and resistances might be determined prior to application of the partial factors we might call these analysis levels and typically they might occur at three stages 
So for example, we might choose to factor um, all the originating actions, uh, which we could regard as external loads and say the soil self weight behind a wall. We might decide to factor all of those as actions and then carry out our ultimate limit state analysis. And that would fall into the pattern of the examples that we've just looked at. Alternatively, in particular for retaining walls, our conventional practice is actually to consider um, the actions that are applied to the surface of the wall. So here we're looking at the active earth pressure, for example, and the shear resistance on the base of the wall. Now we can't actually determine those until we've done an analysis. In, in conventional hand calculation, you'd have perhaps worked out ranking earth pressures, but that's still an analysis and those earth pressures will actually depend on the nature of the failure mode. Um, so in this case, we, we have to do the, the ultimate limit state calculation first to determine those actions and resistances and then apply the factors. And that makes it a little bit more complicated. And this is an issue which affects all numerical methods, um, not just uh, limit analysis or computational limit analysis, which is what limit state geo does. The third level at which uh, one might apply factors is fact properties within the structure. So if it's a sheet pile wall, we might be thinking about the bending moment, the plastic moment of resistance, or in a gravity wall such as this, perhaps a shear force and a shear resistance within the wall. And that again will follow the um, actual collapse calculations. Um, I think in general, the code isn't clear about which level you should analyze for any given problem type, and perhaps you could argue that all three should be checked and the worst case be, be taken in order to deal with potential non-linearities in the system. Um, so that means that if we factor, say, the surface surcharge by 1.35, that may result in uh, the active pressure on the wall increasing by 1.35, but it actually might increase by more than 1.35 or less than 1.35 and um, therefore we need to be aware of the sensitivity of particular properties and actions in the problem to any non-linearities in the system. Um, actually, the, written a couple of papers which try to address these issues there in ground engineering. Um, so uh, they discuss these issues in more detail, but I'm going to look at those um, briefly now. So uh, in terms of analysis level three, this is the easiest one to deal with, action effect factoring. Um, so this is, for example, when we're looking at a sheet pile wall. And what we're trying to do is show that the factored bending moment um, in the wall is less than the factored plastic moment of resistance. So we don't factor anything in advance of the calculation. We just calculate what is the bending moment in the wall, uh, multiply it by 1.35 if we're going to be looking at design approach one, combination one, and then make sure that that is less than the plastic moment of resistance in the wall. So we have to solve the problem first with no factors applied and then factor things afterwards. Now, if the plastic moment of resistance of the wall is a constant, then we can rewrite that equation. Just move the 1.35 to the other side. So M is less than or equal to MP over 1.35. And now we can solve this by a prefactoring approach because all we have to do is reduce the plastic moment of resistance by 1.35. It's a little bit like material factoring. And then we can solve. And if the adequacy factor is greater than 1, then the design will comply with a Euro code 7 for um, factoring of these action effects of bending moment in the actual wall. Um, so we're going to use unit partial factors in the problem. And I'll, we'll just jump back to the software and look at an example. So here we have an example. We're modeling a sheet pile wall. This is using an engineered element. And if I click on that wall, I can look at its properties. And the key thing um, to note, uh, we've covered what all these are 
properties are in a previous webinar, but the key thing for this purpose of this webinar is that this wall has a plastic moment of resistance of 135 kilonewton meters per meter. And um, we're just going to solve this problem with no uh, with unit factors. Um, there is a slight uh, issue with variable and favorable loads uh, that may have or and um, favorable variable loads and unfavorable loads, uh, which we haven't got time to look at here, but they they may need modifying. But essentially, we we work with unit factors. We solve the problem. And in this particular case, we're using a factor on load on the weight of the surcharge behind the wall. It doesn't actually matter where it is as long as it's unfavorable. We're just interested in the adequacy factor being larger or smaller than one. This gives us uh, an analysis. It says that if we multiply the weight of the soil behind the wall by 1.57, the wall will collapse, and this will be the bending moment distribution in the wall. Now, if we look at that bending moment distribution, uh, we see that it gets up to a maximum of around about 113. So I'm hovering the mouse over this distribution and we can see the moment at the base there, about 113. Now it's tempting to look at that analysis and say, okay, well, uh, the moment's 113. Um, if I multiply that by 1.35, I'll get roughly 152. Now that's bigger than the plastic moment of resistance of this sheet pile which was 135, therefore this wall does not comply with the Euro code. However, um, that isn't quite correct. That's a very conservative calculation because note that we've had to multiply the backfill weight by 1.57 in order to get collapse. So that bending moment distribution includes that additional factoring of the weight of the soil. So essentially this wall is over-designed in terms of its length and the computed bending moment is too large as it includes this uh, additional factor. So the, the right way to approach the problem is to actually let the software identify the collapse mechanism um, using the scaled plastic moment. So what we do is instead of applying a moment of 100, 135, we apply a moment of 100, so we scale that down by 1.35. So this is looking at the design as a design approach one combination one. And um, we just solve the problem. Uh, this time the solver finds uh, a solution which actually involves bending of the wall here. We can see that it's essentially going to hinge about this middle point. So when it animates, bends there, and we see that the moment does not exceed 100, which is what it shouldn't do. But even though it's found a collapse mechanism, it's still found an adequacy factor bigger than 1, 1 1.44. So that means that the weight of the soil behind the wall still has to be increased to get collapse in this situation. So that essentially means that without that factor, the system does pass. So We've got this criterion, adequacy is bigger than one. So in fact, that is uh, permissible in this case. And in fact, we'd have to reduce that bending moment of resistance to around about 60 uh, in order that the system is just on the point of instability, i.e. that we have an adequacy factor of around about one. So as soon as we get an adequacy factor of one, that means we don't have to do anything to the system to get collapse. And that means that essentially this is telling us that for an ultimate limit state, um, the bending moment, uh, has to, plastic moment of resistance to the wall would have to be 60. So the most efficient design strength for the wall, according to this, would be to multiply that 60 by 1.35, giving us around about 81. And that would comply with the ultimate limit state. Okay, so that's uh, looking at the sheet pile wall problem. Um, we'll just finish off by uh, looking at, um, briefly looking at the um, level two problem where we're comp comparing, say, active earth pressures with passive earth pressures and so on. I should just say that this, this approach where we're factoring the plastic moment is, 
typically called a starred approach, DA11 star or DA2 star. Um, there are various other issues to do with those which I haven't got time to look at, but that, that's, a, that's a broad essence of, of what we do. Right, our analysis level two, final one to look at. Um, if we look at our conventional analysis of a gravity wall, what we typically do is we calculate an active earth pressure on one side, we calculate passive earth pressure on the other side, we assume there's full base friction and calculate the full resistance there, and we would say that our actions are the active earth pressure, um, the resistances are the base friction plus the passive earth pressure, and we'd compare the two. Now, um, that's our conventional analysis, but if we think about it, those pressures can only arise if the wall is actually failing, if it's actually sliding. But clearly, when we've designed the wall, um, it shouldn't move. So uh, effectively, we have to go back to our principles of ultimate limit state analysis and perturb this system or add some disturbing agent to actually get this thing to fail, either by reducing the strength or applying a force. Now, if we're interested in comparing actions and resistances and factoring those, we're not interested in factoring the strength. We want to stick with our original soil strength. So the approach is actually to apply an additional load H horizontally there that will pull the wall. You can imagine in, 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 in reality, this, you could drive up to this wall with a tractor, attach a chain to it and pull it until it failed. Once you do that, then as it slides, it will be giving you your active pressures on the right, the passive on the left, and your base shear. Um, and that system then keeps the whole thing in equilibrium um, because we've got this extra, extra horizontal load which uh, balances everything out. Um, so we apply this external hypothetical force until we get failure. And then we term, determine the actions and resistances, which remain simply the active pressure, the passive pressure, and the base resistance, and we can ignore H. That's only there to get the system to a ULS. But the things we want to compare are those action and resistances. The downside of this approach is that you do have to consider specifically the mode of failure in the method. So we'll uh, quickly look at the demonstration there. Now, my apologies that we're going to be running slightly over time uh, due to that, that slight hiccup earlier on. Um, so here we have the wall, um, backfill and a surcharge there. We got, haven't got adequacy on the surcharge here. What we're going to do is apply, uh, in this case, a unit load horizontally to the wall to pull it sideways, and in doing so, um, we will induce active pressures on the back of the wall, passive on the front, and the correct base shear on the base there. And it's telling us that we have to apply a load of 107 on this wall. So we've got our unit load multiplied by 107 to pull it sideways to fail, and then it will give us the forces around the wall. Um, this is, again is solved with no other partial factors applied and um, the best way to look at the forces on the wall are to run the report here and get this free body diagrams option and we can flick down and look at the wall here and the wall here it tells us what are the forces acting on each face and they're listed here. So rather than trying to pick those off um, that particular diagram, we'll just jump back to the slides, and I've uh, I've kind of pulled them off in this case. So this is the table that was provided. We know that the horizontal load required to pull that wall was 107 and a half. Um, so the actual passive pressure here, um, the 107 and a half plus the passive pressure must actually equal the overall force on that left-hand side of the wall. Now, the overall force from the table was minus 60, so that essentially means that the passive pressure turns out to be 47.1. So if we add the 47.1 pushing to the right, subtract the 107.5, which moves to the left, that gives us this 60.4, which was given in the table there as the overall force on the wall. So that means, um, effectively, our passive pressure 
or passive resistance is 47.1 kilonewtons per meter. Uh, in terms of the uh, active pressure on D, we want the normal force, which is this 52. So that gives us 52 there. And then we're interested in the base shear on C, which is this 112. And that gives us that value. So now we've determined the passive resistance, the shear resistance, and the active pressure, which we're calling an action. We can then do our design approach one combination one calculation. We multiply the action, the active pressure by 52.1 to get 70.3. The resistances, we add those together. And in this design approach, they're just divided by a unit factor to give us our design resistance. And we see that the actions are less than the resistances. So this complies with design approach one combination one. Um, so that's a, a sort of brief indication of how we might go about solving that type of problem using numerical software. As I said, it's an issue that affects all numerical methods, not just uh, limit state geo. Um, but the material factoring approach is, is a method which is far easier to use with numerical methods and uh, works very complementarily with, with those. Um, I think I've already mentioned this about multi-scenarios, that we can set up multiple scenarios for a problem and solve simultaneously design approach one, design approach two. Uh, so for example, if I go back to um, say a simple footing problem in these analysis scenario manager, I can set up uh, design approach one and then um, oops, sorry, I need to click multiple scenarios. And then in scenario two, uh, design approach two as well. So that, that we've now got uh, two scenarios that will run. And if I then solve what it will do is it will run the first scenario with the first set of factors and the second scenario, the second set of factors, um, and give me both those answers. And then it will identify which one is the most critical case. So in the first case, you can see I've got Euro code 7 design approach 1, and that's given me an adequacy of, in this case, a very large adequacy because we had a unit load on the problem. Design approach 2 is slightly smaller. So this is the critical one. Um, it's indicated that one with a star here, but I can look at either case. In this particular problem, they're both the same mechanism. But it gives you the ability to check multiple sets of combinations of factors in one run. Okay, uh, apologies for overrunning slightly. That brings us pretty much to the end of the, the webinar. So I hope you've seen that the Eurocode analysis and its terminology is built into the software Limit State Geo. Uh, the scenario manager allows, uh, for example, long-term and short-term and design approach one, design approach one, combination two analyses to be run with simple global switches or just setting up multiple scenarios uh, so you can get those all simultaneously. Um, as with all numerical methods, material factoring is most straightforward. Uh, you just set up the scenario manager and go. Um, quite a few action uh, resistance factoring problems also work like that uh, in terms, for example, foundations, basically where the actions are known in advance. Where they aren't known in advance, then uh, it can be a little bit more complicated. Um, but where we get down to analysis level three or the start approach, then uh, that can be transformed in many cases to a problem that looks like material factoring, and then that goes back to being quite a straightforward analysis. Finally, hopefully, as you've seen me using the software, I, I've, I've had to go through it fairly quickly, so I've explained it fully, but I hope you can see it's very interactive and solves quickly. So you can answer what if type questions and quickly get a better feel for the problem. And that we can use the software to solve any ULS problem type. Uh, we don't need to try and shoe on it into a pre-existing solution. And certainly with the Eurocode and the Eurocode having fairly generic factors for any problem, that means that we don't have to worry about whether it is a foundation or a retaining wall or a slope. Uh, we can use the same factors for each problem. And the software, we use it 
in its most powerful way will actually identify the critical mechanism for us and we don't have to investigate the individual individual uh, mechanisms okay so um, that's the end of the webinar um, I'm happy to uh, take questions at this stage Okay, uh, it appears that we don't have any questions that have come through. So uh, I shall pass over to um, my colleague Tom to wrap up the webinar. Thanks, Colin, and thanks everyone for attending. Again, our apologies for the technical issues that we encountered at the start of it. Um, so we hope you found the webinar informative, and as mentioned, if the presentation has sort of sparked any questions that you think of later on, please do get in touch with us um, by info at limitstate.com or give us a call, and we'll be happy to speak to you. For the people who are attending who aren't current users of Limit State Geo, We'll be in touch over the next few days just to get some feedback and find out if you have any further questions about the software and see if it might be useful for you. If you'd like to watch the webinar again, um, or if you think you might know somebody, a colleague perhaps, who would be interested to see it, then there will be a recording available later on and we'll email you with a link once it's available online. Also, please look out for our other webinars that deal with Linux State Geo. We'll be sending out event notifications by email in advance of these and they're also posted on our website at www.limitstate.com forward slash webinars. Finally, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for listening, and I hope that you can join us again for one of the future sessions. Goodbye.